Ark of the Covenant. What was it? Advanced technology? A symbolic metaphor for strength? A magic-imbued artifact? Or God from within a box? I believe I have inadvertently stumbled across the answer to this question, and the simple answer is it was technology. The more complicated answer, I think that there are some of you that may not like to hear this, but let me explain why. But first, for those of you who don't accept the possibility of a dream regression from a past life, then this video is not for you. But for those of you who believe in reincarnation, or even just find the idea entertaining, then this might, might, just blow your mind. And then for those of you who are particularly religious, I think you should not listen to the rest of this episode because I, my intention is not to uh, be critical of religious people, but it may come across that way. And for that, I apologize in advance. So this is my story and how I came to see the components that I think match the Ark of the Covenant. In 2022, I spent two months in Egypt. It was sort of a pilgrimage to see if any of my weird dreams made any sense. I had dreamed of ancient places, including Egypt, since I was a very small child. In fact, as soon as I could speak, I was telling my parents that I came from somewhere else and my real name was Mirren. Oh, and those dreams, those dream regressions that I mentioned, they are vivid, like watching a movie. I have had them as far back as I can remember. So that means that over my 60 years of life, I have done an awful lot of dreaming. And luckily I was sensible enough to keep journals, which I have stacks and stacks of these journals. I've actually been working through the journals uh, so that I can document all the various things I've seen in my dreams. Because the journals have other, you know, very mundane stuff in them as well, like appointments that I had to go to, notes from projects I was working on. So I really would like to throw them out because most of the journals are just the mundane. But within these, the pages of these journals are details of these weird, weird dreams. So I've worked through about one quarter of the journals. And of that, um, maybe I've made a half of them into episodes. So I've still got a lot of work ahead of me going through these journals. The collection of dream regressions that I'm going to tell you about today is is really something out of the ordinary and I have been reluctant to talk about it for fairly obvious reasons um, which will become even more clear as I take you on the journey through this story. So uh, this is what happened. After my time in Egypt I found myself having the same dream over and over Initially, I was underground at Giza, searching for something. The dynastic Egyptians had found something, apparently, and it was my job to sneak around and find it and either take the item or disable it. For those of you who have not checked out my other episodes, um, it's important for you to know that in my dream regressions, I was from a place called Tantau, which matches quite closely to what we call Atlantis today. And I was essentially one of the ancients. And um, so it was my job to try and find technology that some of us had left behind uh, so they didn't get into the wrong hands. All I knew about this item that I was supposed to find was that it was something that could be used in a destructive manner. So it was in a way dangerous in the wrong hands. 
But at this point in the dream, I really didn't know what it was that I was looking for. And it wasn't something that was clear in the dreams. And the dream was repeating and it was a little bit annoying. So this item was something that the dynastic Egyptians were not supposed to have. And I, I will explain towards the end of the episode, or maybe in a part two, I'm not sure which, where the item actually came from and how the dynastic Egyptians got it. But at this point, I'll just explain the dreams. So there was a strong sense of urgency in this dream. And every morning when I woke up, I was left with this this feeling of not having done something really, really important that needed to be done. So I felt kind of annoyed with myself every morning. And then the next night it was the same dream and again and again, each morning waking up with that same feeling. And there was very little new within the dream at this point. It was just the same dream just repeating over and over. I might see an extra door or, or go down a slightly different corridor, but the dream essentially was the same. Sure, you can imagine how frustrating it would be to have the same dream over and over, virtually exactly the same dream. And I, in, in the comments section of my channel, I started writing about how frustrated I was that I was getting this repeating dream over and over. And um, at that point, I didn't really understand what it was all about. And then when I got the next part of the dream, um, which I'll talk about shortly, it all got a little bit clearer and then a little bit clearer. I was on my own for this part of the dream. I was dressed like a dynastic Egyptian female, which for some reason felt very uncomfortable to me. Usually when I was out on assignment, looking, in, in an area where there was a more primitive kinds of people, I would be dressed as a male in order to be less obvious and also so that I wasn't um, attacked in a certain ways that could be extremely unpleasant. But anyway, I was dressed like a female. <clears throat> it was uncomfortable and it was like, it felt like weeks of this recurring dream. And it really was tormenting me until suddenly it just switched. I came out of an underground passage through a door that looked like a wall. It was a massive stone on a hinge. It was leveraged in such a way that you had to know exactly where to push for it to move and, and actually be a door. Otherwise, it was just a big block of stone. And of course, I knew how to move it. And that was when the dream changed. And the next dream that occurred, I was on top of the Giza Plateau. And there were lots of different paths and there was some very high walls at the sides of these paths. And I was near to the Great Pyramid, but not close enough to actually touch it. Not close enough to get into the inner boundary area but I could see the white limestone casing and I could see all the way up. It was dusk, so the pyramid, well, all the pyramids were gleaming and because it was covered in the uh, white limestone, I knew that the time frame I was in was at least the Old Kingdom, maybe, maybe even after the Old Kingdom. But um, trying to work out what time frame this dream is in, I have to be very observant at the things around me. But uh, that was a good hint for me because the Old Kingdom, during the Old Kingdom, the dynastic Egyptians had renovated the whole site of Giza and they covered the Old Pyramid with beautiful white casing stones. And that's a big job. So give the dynastic Egyptians their due. They, they could do a lot of amazing work. And I could also see the other two pyramids, one of which was um, two colours. It was dark at the bottom and lighter from about one the third the way up. And in the distance, I could see a fourth sort of pyramid. 
it was a beautiful, massive yellow obelisk pyramid. So it was a pyramid at the bottom, not massive like the Great Pyramid, but still pretty significant in size. The pyramid was also two-tone, but it was black at the bottom. And from about halfway up, it was yellow. And there was a big, incredibly beautiful, shining yellow obelisk on the top of this this pyramid and it was super tall so it you could see it from a long way away and i've i've done an episode on when i went to egypt i tried to find the location of where i saw this particular building and uh, i f- tried to work it out from where i remember i was when i saw it and so we went into the desert and i believe i found the location and uh, But that's another story, so you can go and look that up on my channel if you're interested in seeing where I found this um, yellow pyramid obelisk. So this new dream, or new part of the dream, it was just as annoying and repetitive as the first one. Over and over, night after night, I was on the Giza Plateau, hiding from dynastic Egyptians, and searching, 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 searching. And this continued like before with very small differences in the dream over and over and over. Once again, in the comments section of my channel, I talked about this dream and how annoying it was, still not fully understanding the implications of where this dream was leading me to. But um, this dream was quite a bit different to the first series of repetitive dreams because this time I intermittently met up with someone I knew, also an ancient, and they were also searching at the same time as me. So it was the two of us searching. And they'd tell me what progress they'd made and I would do the same. So over and over, with very little change, as I said, this dream would repeat each night. And bits from this annoyingly repetitive dream indicated to me that the dynastic Egyptians had found something in what I assumed to be the Fayum area. And uh, and they had then brought it to Giza. Now, if you want the details of why that assumption was made, just put it into the comments and ask the question and I'll, I'll tell you in more detail. But I realise that this episode is going to be very long. So there's a few things that I've skipped over just to um, make it not last three hours, if you knew what I mean. Anyway, every time I had the dream, I'd have the same discussion with my colleague. And over and over, we talked about the dynastic Egyptians and them trying to find items from the ancient times of Kem, which is the ancient name for Egypt. Uh, It was from a long time ago, before the dynastic Egyptians lived in the area, that the place was called Kem. And I believe some people call it Kemet, but that to me has a different meaning. To me that means not just the place, but the people, the culture, the food they eat, the way they spoke. That little bit on the end just made it mean a lot more than just a location. But once again, I deviate. So I'm going to start getting back on the track of the dream. But um, anyway, so the dynastic Egyptians moved into the area and having taken over the land, it was full of ruins at the time that were filled with intriguing objects and to them magic. They became obsessed with searching for all the things that belonged to the ancients to renovating the buildings of the ancients, to making the buildings their own, and to obviously finding any magic, any what we would call technology, um, so that they could fiddle with it and use it and, and do their magic things with it. In my opinion, the dynastic Egyptians were, I guess, fanatics when it came to searching the ruins of what once had been an Atlantean outpost university. Of course, Atlantis wasn't called Atlantis in my dreams. 
it was actually called Tantal. But in these discussions with my colleague, um, we touched on what the dynastic Egyptians were doing with these items that they found. And most of the items were fairly innocuous. So most of the time, we didn't really worry about it too much. But this one, the one we were now searching for, was incredibly dangerous. And I don't know how my people found out that they had it in their possession, but it was something that people were really worried about them having. Anyway, apparently the dynastic Egyptians were, were in the process of building something in the Delta region in order to keep these items safe. In fact, probably keep the items, the people safe from the items as much as the items safe as well as hide the items, maybe experiment with the items, maybe even worship the items, who knows. But they were in the process of building something. And um, it was thought that we really had to get our hands on it before they took it to this other location. So that was what I was doing. And uh, we did know that as soon as that area was ready, that the item would be moved. And it was hoped that we could possibly intercept it uh, discreetly before it was moved or as it was being moved. Not sure, just, yeah, a bit like spying really. And, uh, but anyway, the dream on the top of the Giza Plateau continued, as I said, night after night until eventually something changed. I saw the item. I climbed up onto a high wall and I could see four men, priests, I think, and they were carrying a box on two poles. Before you start getting excited about what I saw at this point, I must let you know that it didn't look anything at all like the Ark of the Covenant as we know it. And so at this point, I did not link what I saw to the Ark of the Covenant. And there are several reasons for this. First of all, the box was tall and it was shaped, well, it was wider at the bottom and thinner at the top. And it was a bit like a flat topped obelisk. It was gold and black and it had multiple small doors. And the doors were on one side. It didn't have a lid, it didn't lift off the top. And it looked absolutely nothing, as I said, like the Ark of the Covenant. And the poles, now they, the poles were interesting because they glistened. And one looked like it was some kind of blue stone and the other looked like a red stone. They looked very crystalline, really, really beautiful. And each one had a fairly interesting looking top bit to it. It looked a little bit like a jed pillar in 3D. So if you... If you imagine the jed pillars that are kind of 2D and you turn them into 3D, that's what the little top knots of these um, poles looked like. The way they were carrying it, it looked like it weighed nothing at all. It, it, it looked very light, but um, this is an important point because what I come to later on, you'll understand why I've made this point. But anyway, so um, they were carrying this box and the box had two gold loops at each side of the box and that was where the rods had gone through for them to carry it. And they had at the front and back of the box one black loop um, sort of angled at a different in a different way. So angled like a basketball hoop rather than angle sideways and I think it was only the one at the front and one at the back that's how it looked but it could have been two at the front and two at the back that's just not 100% clear but I'm absolutely sure there was at least one at the front and one at the back even though it didn't look very heavy um, they seemed to be carrying the box very very carefully and they carried it into a temple on the Giza Plateau 
and we manage to follow them in without being observed. And this part is a bit mysterious because I don't know how they didn't manage to see us, but they didn't see us. And um, we were kind of sneaking around, but nobody seemed to notice that we were there. Anyway, they placed the box on a large stone table and they opened up each section of the box. The first part of the box that they opened was at the bottom and they removed a large green block of stone and I'm thinking how could it look so lightweight with such a massive piece of stone in there so I'm thinking there's some there's some of the technology built into this box that makes it lightweight but anyway that's by and by and that was the lowest compartment Then the next level up, there was a white clear crystal thing with something inside it that seemed to be moving. I can't describe it easily, so I'll do my best to create an image of what I saw in in the video footage so that you can at least get a reasonable idea of what it was that I saw. And finally, there was the top section of the box, which they opened up. And in it, it was divided and there were two gold statues and these statues were on a black base, a looked like rock, a black rock base. And both of these statues were of women wearing an Atlantean cloak with their arms outstretched in a classic kind of Egyptian style pose. And that was the moment I thought to myself, ooh, Ark of the Covenant. That was the first moment that I had that realization. They put the statues on the the stone table facing each other and the two black bases were positioned so that the, the, the two statues did not touch. So they came quite close, but they didn't actually touch. They then lifted the box off the table and they put it on the ground. So they had the box put to one side. On the table, they had a big green stone slab. Um, They had the crystalline looking thing with the thing moving inside it. And they had the two statues, the two golden statues. And... The floor that they put the box on was also stone, pretty much just like the uh, table. And they slid the poles out from the sides of the box and they positioned the pole, one at the front through the black, back black loop that I mentioned and the other at the back through a black loop. And one of the Egyptians commented to the other, it works better if you can push the poles into the soil. But obviously they couldn't because the ground was stone. So they just had to leave it standing, the end standing on the stone. Assuming one of the priests was not as experienced as the other, because one priest said, to never touch the statues except by the base. And he said, watch this. And he tilted one of the statues by lifting one side of the black base. And as the outstretched wings got closer to the wings of the other statue, it started to hum and buzz and spark. And it became very electrified and, uh, yeah, he, he put it back down again. And so he said then, you can imagine what happens if the wings touch. So, yeah, we, we can imagine, that's for sure. They then proceeded to chant things about the ancients being good and and the gifts of the ancients and ancient magic to the king and, and gifts and power and Oh, all kinds of things. They were doing this nice little chanting thing. They seemed to be quite enjoying it. You know, blah, 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 chanty, chant, chant. Anyway, 
I thought to myself, it wasn't even a very catchy tune, but they seemed to be enjoying it. It really was just mindless chanting, and can't see what the purpose of it was, but it was obviously something important to them. Then picked up the clear crystal item, and they placed it on top of the green block, and they put each statue at each side of the block. Slowly, they pushed the statues towards this crystal block, and as it contacted the block, this green block lit up, and there was stunning green light filling the room, and the inside of the crystallized item that was on top seemed to be moving even faster, and in the dream, I felt like I recognised both these items as part of a much larger machine for generating energy. But most importantly, I knew that this thing was deadly in the wrong hands. After a while, there seemed to be a growing feeling of a vibration, like a really low sound just out of hearing. But you could feel the sound. You couldn't hear it, but you could feel it. Almost like a deep rumbling feeling. And the first priest said that it wasn't good to let it hum for too long. So they proceeded to pull the statues away, holding onto the black base, obviously. And the vibrations and the light then died away. They didn't touch the green stone block or the crystal item when the statues were touching them. Um, I'm not sure if they could or not, but they didn't touch them. But they were easily able to touch the, those, both those items once the statues had been pulled away. And they simply picked up the crystal item and put it to one side. They carefully carried the statues, the block, the crystal item and the rods into a completely sealed room with massive stone doors which was hinged on the top and the bottom of the door. As they carried each, carried each item through into the storage room, I was able to get a glimpse at some of the other things that were in this room. And on the walls, there were many shelves, and they were full of beautiful stone vases, some bottles, some bowls, lots of stone items as well as a few other very, very interesting technological items. But this has already got a little bit too long, so I'm going to stop here, and this is going to be the end of part one. And when we get to come to part two, I'll describe some of the other things that I saw within this room, as well as more background on the technology that... Uh, these items possessed and how they came into the possession of the dynastic Egyptians and also how this relates to the Ark of the Covenant. So stay tuned for part two. Might take me a while to get to part two because it's been a big job getting this far so please be patient with me. Thanks.